Hello everyone, I'm Adam Papp again, and welcome to another episode of There's a Place, the ASMR talk show, the show that feels good to hear. Uh, I, before the show, I had one of the strangest drinks I've ever drank uh, that I could ever come up with. It was um, espresso flavored chocolate wine that I got from the 99 cent store. Where else? A 99 cent store, you know, inflation happens and stuff. Uh, a lot of items are $1.99, $2.99, $3.99. So this is a $2.99 odd item, but um, it was uh, Choco Vine from Holland. I guess chocolate wine is a thing in Holland, and they had it at the 99 cent store, so I gotta try it, you know. You always got to, I love the 99 cent store because uh, they just have these weird food items that um, are kind of like, this is the last chance. It's like a thrift store for food. And um, so, you know, it was a, a very bizarre sensation. It was like yoo mixed with uh, cheap, cheap, cheap red wine, like 99 cent store red wine and then a coffee flavor on top of it. Um, but you know, it was tasty and uh, I like it and maybe I'll get it again, especially if I'm ever in Holland. That's the first thing I'm gonna remember. And that's the real lesson of the 99 cent store is that uh, you know, if you see something, indulge in it, try it out. It's a lot like life, it's kind of metaphorical. Uh, 99 cent stores, you know, if you see something, 99 cent store, hold on to it because you may never see it again, you know, something that makes you happy, something fun like that. Uh, really enjoy it. And if you're ever in Holland, check out the uh, chocolate red wine, chocolate infused red wine. Uh, well, uh, my guest tonight is uh, a young comedian, a uh, young man, but he's been on the scene a very long time. A big fan of his Instagram. He uh, documents his life very well. It seems. Uh, interesting and uh, following him on Instagram has left me with some questions, want to fill in the gap. So uh, please welcome our guest tonight, Roger Lopez. He does not have a head. Okay, here he comes. <laughs> How you doing tonight, Roger? How was your 4th of July? Culver City Fireworks. How, I was just say, how does Fourth of July rank for you in terms of holidays? Don't really care about it. It's not a, a big one. No, my parents got tacos from like a food truck, so it wasn't like a big deal at all. What are your favorite holidays? Christmas. Christmas is the big one. Well then, what don't you like about Fourth of July? No, it's cool. I just don't really like. Some people like make it. I guess because I have like a smaller family, I'm not really doing too much like with my family. And then, uh, so, but I did hang out with my girlfriend and for the past couple of years. We've been going to like Culver City or like uh, like Baldwin Hills, see the Buffalo. I wanted. I was trying to go there last night. The, the yeah, I had heard of it. That's a good one. I don't know what time, but it was like before sunset, and then we barely found parking like up the hill. And then it's good, dude. You're a, you're a West Sider, right? So that's yeah. a. Um, yeah, I'm from West Los Angeles. Oh yeah, dude. I, oh, I, yeah. I was uh, watching the Victor Martinez one, mm -hmm. and then uh, I was like, "Yo, you're from uh, LA?" I was like, "That's cool, man." Mm -hmm. It's a um, it's a rare thing to be from West Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. Um, it's kind of like being Canadian or something where it's like, it's like being from Los Angeles, but like a little bit different. You know what I mean? Yeah, you think it's, so? Dude? It's got its own kind of little, mm -hmm. I don't know, but like when you think of West Los Angeles, how would you describe it? I think it depends where you are in West Los Angeles because there's like, there's like some sh pockets of shit. And then there's some like real nice outer parts, and then there's the beach parts yeah. where it's extra nice. Some of the nicest parts in the whole city are in West LA. 
Santa Monica, uh, Manhattan. Uh, you know. When you think of like West LA landmarks, what do you think of? Like Santa Monica Pier, that's big, or like the the shitty Culver City um, Hotel, that's like where the Pacific Theaters used to be, and that's mm -hmm. now an arc light. Yeah. I just found out it used to be like a real crack den, like it used to be really fucked up. It is a pretty crummy hotel. Yeah, I've never seen it inside, but it looks it looks decent from the outside. Why did you say it was crummy then? Because like he, he told me like he told me that it was shitty. Like, that's what I was like. We should check it out. I should. I just never thought about it because, like, growing up, it always looked so fancy. So. We're, we're doing good. Okay. And also, I got a, um, this ASMR talk show. Yeah, I guess so. Just keep the voice, yeah. yeah. Well, because people get excited and they kind of mm -hmm. ramp up the talking. Oh, no, 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 it's okay. Um, it's just something that uh, we've been told to kind of keep. Mm -hmm keep an eye on so yeah that's good and we're doing great nice yeah so roger for um you know a guy your age heavy metal hard rock music it's not you, you know like um it's, it's kind of brave to be into hard rock music hmm. You know, it's it's just it's kind of like a niche thing. You know, I love rock music. Yeah. So, um, but uh, you know, you could just so easily be into like rap music or or, or something from the internet or like anything else. Mm -hmm. But what got you into hard rock music? I think because like, I have so much energy compared to like some other music, like with the hard riffs and like the like the distortion that they have on the electrics. It makes it like a it makes it more enjoyable, at least to me, than like some like rap beat. Yeah, the aggression. Mm -hmm. Why do you think you go for like that style over like, you know, the top 40 music? I think one, because of, like how I grew up, I guess, you know, it's just not fighting a lot, but it wasn't always the best, you know, at home. So it was like a nice to have like an emotional, like this is fucking heavy. And then uh, also because my buddies, like my buddy got me into it. And then whatever, whatever he was into, I would get into. But like, because I really enjoyed it, you know, like he got me into like graffiti before that. Oh, you're, you're a tagger? Yeah, like when I was like in sixth grade, I used to go to the Smart and Final by my house. And then I used to see like these like dripper glue pens. And then you, you drip all the glue out and then you put paint inside, and then it, it becomes like a dripper. So you like, when you like graffiti on the wall, like you do like an R, and then the, it would just drip, you know? It's nice. How did you figure out that you could do that? Because my buddy, the, the same buddy that would introduce me to like metal and like rap before that, he would be like, he was a real good tagger. Do you think he was a good influence on you or a bad influence? I think he was the best influence on me. He's like my older brother. He's like three years older than me. And then he had an older brother three years older than him. And then, uh, when we first met, like he wanted to beat me up. Uh, yeah, it was. Uh, but ever since then, we've been tight. What's he doing now? Oh, just before the show, he told me like, "Yo, I just quit my job. I got two UFC two fourteen tickets." Who wants to go so I can, you know, feed myself? <laughs> it was like 90 bucks for a ticket. It's sweet. It's very sweet. Uh, but he said, like, he's gonna, he's gonna go where the wind takes him. <laughs> so he's still out there. Are you still influenced by him? Uh, like not as much as it, I was before, you know, because he has since changed to like some other stuff that I'm not the most into, okay. or, like, or like I introduced him to some shit and then he likes it over the metal shit sometimes, and that's what he plays mostly. But it's understandable, you know. He just chose what he really enjoyed. So he's now away from the metal. 
No, nah, he he would right. listen to metal like you know every now and then, but he's also like into like a lot of the indie stuff, like the Strokes. Like he likes the way they play. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I like your eyes. You're like, yeah, no, no, yeah. I know. Mm -hmm. Well, I know. I want to say I don't know much about metal or hard rock, mm -hmm. but I got to say you have probably one of the best T-shirt collections in comedy. Um, yeah, sometimes I think. It's distracting if somebody wears a like a cool T-shirt on stage, mm. but in your case, it makes me want to know more. Um, mm. So, who are like your top? If I was trying to get into like, like not like like Cradle of Filth, like the heaviest metal, mm. like some like makeup, like something from Europe, nothing like that, but just like ge like general like hard rock, heavy metal music. Who are the big groups? Like beyond, like obviously Metallica, Slayer. Yeah. Like I know all of them, but like, what's like the next tier down? To like a, a not a next tier down, but like a like oh like not as heavy like hard rock would be like to the Scorpions. Okay, I wanted to ask you about them. I, I, I have one of their records. It's got like a guy with sunglasses on it, or maybe, um, like a bandage over his face. It's a blue and white. Dude, that is one of the. That's uh, that's called Blackout, and it was, yeah. came out in '82, I want to say. Yeah. But the Scorpions have been together since like 1968, I think. A long time. They were like a, a kraut rock kind of group. Mm. And that's one of those groups where I'm like, I no, I think they're cool, and people are like, nah, nah, they're not cool. But I'm like, no, I think they're, I don't know, but I think they're cool. They're very good. So what, Scorpions, where should I go next after Blackout? Oh, like the the next album after that, which is coincidentally the only album I have of theirs, is um, Love at First Thing, which is like 84, I think. And then that one has like a bunch of bangers. And that's, a, that's the album that had like their biggest song that like took them on tour, like around the world. Which was, uh, well, they were already going on tour around the world, but like uh, Rocky Like a Hurricane was on there. Yeah, okay, so that's them. Yeah. And then um, another good band would be like, I was talking to the, I forgot his name, but the guitarist. Norm. Norm. And then uh, he was talking about the band Sabotage. Oh, I think I've heard of that, but that I'm hardly familiar. Dude, they have like. He was talking about a really good album. I forget the name, but I have like a T-shirt of one of theirs, and then it's called "The Hall of the Mountain King." That's a. So you have the T-shirt, but you don't even know the group. No, I did. I, I did. I just. I was just like telling you. Like, oh, he was, okay. Because he asked me like, "Bro, do you know about Sabaton?" I was like, "Dude, I was wearing this shirt yesterday." Where do you get good rock music shirts? Oh man, like. Back in the days when I was like in high school, I would get them at Rocktown. Oh, on Hollywood Boulevard. Yeah. There's Rocktown and Rock City, or Hot Rocks is the other one. There's mm. two right there. Yeah. Rocktown is the better one? It's, it's like the more small one. They're both small, but yeah. one has more jackets than the other one. That one. Rocktown. Yeah, Rocktown. See, I'm on Hollywood Boulevard a lot. Mm. I should maybe get a shirt. Hmm. Who sh what shirt should I get at Rocktown? Don't shirt, don't... Obviously, like, the music will play a factor, like, how good the band is. Mm -hmm. But I want you recommend me a good shirt to get, just for, like, fashion's sake. Totally. Uh, one of my favorite shirts is, I think they have it, it's called Testament's uh, New Order. And then it's like, it, it says Testament in big letters right here. And then it has, like, a big planet in the middle of the t-shirt. And, like a, like, a blue demon face over it. What do you think the best rock t-shirt of all time is, or that you've ever seen? Maybe not of all time, but just one that springs to mind as being particularly cool. I remember like growing up, like me and my friends were, would always be like, bro, they don't even make this shirt no more. And like we saw it once and it blew our minds. Too. And it was a Megadeth, so far, so good, so what? It's like a it's like a guy holding like a flamethrower kind of. It's cool. And then you saw it. Yeah, we, like like collectively we were like, bro, did you see the shirt? We're like, yeah, dude. <laughs> <laughs> this way.
It does a lot to move the band forward. A good shirt. It's yeah. good advertising. It, it says a lot about, you know, like... A band. Yeah, the attitude. Yeah, like the... I remember, like, they, they would have this one famous artist, and he's known to do, like, a lot of bands, like, a heavy metal bands, album covers. And then he's like, Megadeth, like, Exit and shit. And, uh, that makes sense that it would always be the same guy. Yeah, he's getting, he's a monopoly on the work. Uh -huh. uh, but there's always like their own creative works and shit. The Iron Maiden. You have the shirt that's all of the different versions of the skeletons hanging out. I saw a picture of you wearing it. I used to have that shirt. I got it at a thrift store and I had to stop wearing it because Iron Maiden fans kept coming up to me and talking to me about, like, punishing me about Iron Maiden. I was just like, I don't know, like, the skeletons wearing shorts. Like, I just liked it. Like, and so I had to, I got rid of the shirt. Dude, I know why you did. Because I get the same shit. And I, like, I got it at, like, the Hot Topic when I was, like, 15. And I really liked Iron Maiden. But I didn't know it was, like, faggy to get that shirt. And then I got it, and then I was, I was getting shit progressively after that. And then the only reason why I wore it recently is because my girlfriend was like, what, so what, you're a faggot if you care about what they think. And then I'm like, you're right. And then ever since then, like, people would just give me compliments for wearing the shirt. But maybe that's also because I'm not around some ignorant Mexicans like I was in high school. <laughs> yeah. The shirt has transcended time. You know, it's because I've dressed it. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's not the shirt, it's the guy wearing it. Um, I don't know how to uh, approach this, so I'll just ask. You had cancer recently. Yeah, today. Oh, my God. No, that's, that's what I was going to ask. <laughs> I don't know, it's, it's, that's the kind of thing. You don't have it anymore, right? Uh, hopefully not. Yeah. We could talk, because you don't have it, we can talk about it with yeah. more levity, yeah, right? Cause, yeah, because uh, today I actually went to the doctor after like three months after my CT scan. And uh, he told me like my options, like so I did have cancer, right? It was like testicular cancer. And I noticed like one Sunday like afternoon, I touched my right ball and it was like hard as rock. Was I, it, had it been hard for a long time? And then you're finally like, I'm gonna do something about this? Or just all of a sudden? All of a sudden, I noticed it hard and I freaked the fuck out. Because I looked up the symptoms of like why it could be hard. And then I was really hoping it was gonna be like a epidemicist. But that was just like me fooling myself and thinking it's not really like testicular cancer. Yeah, and then uh, after that I went to, the, I didn't have health insurance. So I went to the fucking clinic by the LA Fitness. Like an urgent care kind of thing? Nah, just a regular clinic, just to go like see what he thinks. And he, he felt it, he was like, yeah. it was funny because I had a, I went in for a cough, like I, that was pretty bad for me, and my ball sack. And then he, he touched my ball sack and he was like, hey dude, this doesn't feel good to me, like I want you to go see the, my friend, the urologist down like in downtown. And before you go to him, go get some like blood work done, get some x-rays done, and go get your ultrasound done today. And I was like, fuck. I was really freaking out, like I felt bad, dude. And then I went to um, get my ultrasound. I like the Beverly Tyler and Wilshire, like the same day. And then uh, like, so the guy's like putting like the gel on my, the shit they put on pregnant women. Yeah. And then he puts it like right over my like, <clears throat> ball sack. And then like, I tell him like, what, what do you think? And he's like, yeah, definitely. It like, looks like a mess. And I'm thinking like, fuck, it's fucking cancer. But he's like, nah, I don't think about it. Like, and then one thing he told me, he was like a Soviet soldier. Uh, like, and then he told me, don't panic. No, don't panic, never give up, and you'll be okay. Or never give up, don't panic, you'll be okay. And then I, I wrote that down in my notebook. And then I just like repeated it, like, 
because like that was a big thing like not stressing out too much over it and then um I saw the urologist the next day and then he was like yeah dude I don't like this at all dude like we're gonna have to fucking cut like through my pubes right here and like fish it out and I'm like for real dude he's like yeah dude like we don't need a biopsy we gotta like cut it out and then I, he's like you don't have insurance I'm gonna try to get you a deal that's gonna be like 60 no like 6 grand but that's just like the surgery like I didn't know how much like the CT scans are like 4 grand and then I talked to my buddy. He told me, you can go to the DPSS over on uh, Pico and Sepulveda. And see oh, yeah. You. Oh, thank God, dude. And then because I only made $5,000 that year dry cleaning, I, I could apply for emergency medical also because of my situation. The next day, I pick up my slip. I go to the motherfucking Kaiser because, like, the night before, I had, like, a fever of, like, 202.5. And then the day I got my emergency thing, I had a fever that night of a 202 again. And like those whole two days, like I thought I was gonna like die. Like I had really bad anxiety. Like I couldn't really feel like my hands back then. Like it was really bad. And then after that, my dad was like, like you have this thing, like let's, we should go to the Kaiser that like down the block where I grew up at. I always went to that one. We went to the emergency room and they were like, dude like you have fucking bronchitis like and i was like what the fuck and and then uh, they told me like, yeah but he also have like this mask right here like and i'm like yeah like i've been dealing with that for the past like three days now and then they helped me out with the bronchitis like you can be like i was just, just like some fucking uh antibiotic because i'm allergic to penicillin so i couldn't do that and then uh, they gave me like uh I had uh, like two inhalers, so a steroid one and a regular one, and then some other pro And then, well, I, and then the, the urologist in downtown was like, "Hey man, we can't do surgery on you because you have bronchitis. You, you can, we, because the anesthesia could like mm. more chance they can kill you. Like there's there's already a chance you can kill anybody, but." I was like, fuck, that sucks, because I know it's a fucking tumor, so I want this shit out immediately. But they're like, dude, we're going to have to schedule this for like two more weeks. And I'm like, what the fuck, dude? And then, uh, and then I go to the Kaiser for my checkup on the bronchitis, like a week later, and I'm like, better, right? Oh. What you do in that week while you were waiting around? Oh, I do a lot. I just stand up, dude. <laughs> There's like doing like doing comedy and going out and just shooting the shit and just getting my mind away from like my testicles hard as fuck. So you didn't change anything? No, dude. I mean, um, You doubled down on the I, stuff you already like to do. No, actually, no. I, I gave up smoking that week because like of the bronchitis. And then I took up like I heard Tommy Chong say on the Doug Benson getting high with Doug say he cured his uh, skin cancer or like it helped him a lot. Uh, see, and, like Rips, Rick Simpson, like uh, like heavy duty, heavy duty CO2 medical oil like from cannabis, and he would apply it to like his skin and shit, and then it would like really like help it. And so I fucking I took a lot of it, and then I applied that shit on my ball sack as well, because you know why not. And then I gave some to my dad. And then he woke up the next day. He was like tripping. But he was like, dude, I was so high the whole night. Like, you're, I told your mom, like, please get me an ambulance. <laughs> and then she, and then I had gotten her high like a, a year before that. And she was like, she already knew that what he was going through. She was like, nah, it's okay. Just like relax. And then, uh, and then the CO2 oil was something that I used instead of like um, smoking weed. And then I would also like start doing a lot more edibles. Yeah. So the week goes by, you go back to Kaiser. And then the, the doctor's like, he's like, hey dude, I haven't seen you in a while. I'm like, yeah, I just got this fucking, I just got like health insurance real quick. And then he told me like, hey, they all, like, how's your bronchitis? I'm like, it's, it's fine, it's getting better, thank God. And then he told me like, they also know you have like a mask, right? And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, do you just want to get that taken care of with us? 
I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? I'm like, I would love to. Like, that's my favorite thing to do. Because I'm like, not even like three minutes driving. Like, I walked there today. It took me like 10 minutes. And then um, he told me we would have to start the process over. But I would have my surgery date like in so-and-so. I would see the urologist and everything. And I was like, thank God, man. Because I didn't want to go to like some county hospital or do some other shit. And then luckily the insurance covered the surgery and the CT scans following. And, uh, but, but I did, I had the surgery date, like, it took like, I, got, I found out the mass was there February 8th. The surgery wasn't until like March 7th, no, March 14th. So it had been like a month and a half. Did you do any like Make-A-Wish Foundation type stuff? No. You didn't go to Disneyland, you didn't go to a nice dinner, <laughs> you didn't do anything? <laughs> to try to like, no dude, I just fucking, I just try to do a lot of stand-up and just really keep my mind off it. I went to like Rosarito for a bit, and then that didn't feel good at all, because I knew I still had to go through surgery, and like, my ball sack is like a tumor. So I didn't really, I didn't feel good besides doing stand-up and like, being at home with shit. Just being out, just doing the same things I would usually do, trying not to like think of the right night that's I'm, I'm about to lose. But then what, in March they dug it out of you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, they, I, I like to say they fished it out of me. Because everybody thinks they would cut through the sack, but they actually shaved my pews on the right side and put, cut like an incision. And then they fished it out. The and, right one. Yeah, the right one. And then they snipped it. And, um, and that was sent to the, I think it's called the pathologist. And he checks, like, I guess he cuts up the fucking tumor nut. And then he checks, like, if it has, if it's, like, benign or malignant. The chances were that it was going to be malignant, you know, which is the one that is bad, you know. So I get, uh, I get the surgery done. I go see him on the 24th of March. And then I scheduled a CT scan like a couple of days after that. And then those, and then like after that, I went to the emergency room because I had felt like my leg was like, my calf was hurting. And it, it was due to like my like, not mo moving so much post-surgery. But I thought it was like a blood clot because it's common too, because I was like taking Vicodins which, for pain, which it could like uh, increase my chance of having a blood clot on my leg. So I went and then they did like a ultrasound right here and they were like, no, you're fine. And then the, the lady told me like, oh, your results, your like, your blood work for your, your cancer, like post-cancer is in and it looks fine. Like, oh, no, and then not. And then she also told me like, the x-rays, they look fine. So now it was just on to the, up to the oncologist to see the actual CT scans. And then like, like two days later, my doctor, the urologist, Dr. Merchant calls me, he's like the best, you know, I love the guy. And then he tells me like, yo man, uh, I got a call from the oncologist. He, he says, you're fine dude, like the cancer hadn't spread from you know the right testicle to the rest of my body. And I, I think that's because I changed my diet completely, obviously. Like, I started eating a lot of vegetables, cut out all, all the processed fucking junk food. Um, I also think it's because I took a lot of fucking oil, a lot of fucking edibles. Like, it's really... You credit the marijuana. What? You credit the marijuana with curing your cancer. Or, or helping it not helping spread. Helping it not spread. <laughs> that's kind of a vague... I just, uh, what you say is kind of... Uh, kind of, it, uh, it helped it to not spread. Yeah, yeah only because... Uh, you want to go so I'm hard. just taking this from, like, the funny story that Tommy Chong said yeah. on Doug Benz's podcast, which was like, yeah, because cause when, the, when the cannabis oil is inside you, all the cancer cells get so high <laughs> that they can't multiply. Oh, maybe that's true. I think your body starts, like, your own immune system, and you eating correctly, giving yourself the fuel to, like, kill the cancer. Or, like, help it not just... Yeah, run a train on your body. That might be true. Dude. And then also, another big one. This is a secret. I'm going to tell everybody right now. Good energy. 
positive fucking energy thinking yeah. that your chances are already fine like having all the support of my family like my grandma in Mexico like praying for me like everybody like comics telling me like get well like some praying for me like it's fucking it was, like it was great what you think about you bring about what happened what you think about you bring about well yeah um, yeah, so I don't want to fucking think about negative stuff. Yeah. And my girlfriend was like a big proponent of like, hey, stop thinking that stupid shit. Like, stop thinking positive. Like, my chances were 85% chance that I'm fine. Which is why I got the 85? call. 85? Yeah. Oh, that's pretty good. <sighs> Thank fucking God. That's pretty good. I, I have, uh, I think, I forgot what it was called, but the type of testicular cancer I had was stage one. The best kind of cancer you can have if you have cancer it has like a 100 percent treatment rate and then uh if i were uh, like today the the the, my my urologist talked to me about like taking chemo pills like one day chemo and then that would boost my chances to 95 percent that i'm fine and then it would also cut the times, it would also cut like how many times I have to do CT scans per the next five years. Because apparently one CT scan is worth 100 x-rays and radiation. So he says like that won't do damage now, but that could and like it's been shown to like compound over like 40 years. So when you're 60, you may see like, you know, something wrong. What do you think gave you the cancer? Hot Cheetos, folks. Don't eat motherfucking hot Cheetos. And especially not before you go right to bed. Especially not. Do you really think it was junky, chemical, lean um, food? I, I, I don't think it helped, man. I don't think coming home from Mike's at like 2, stopping at the 7-Eleven for their 2 for 2 deal, getting two bags of chips, stopping at the Carter Jr. to get a spicy chicken, two of them, Eating all of that and then going right to bed. You were, you know, young when you were doing this. Yeah, I was so like maybe 21, 22. That's oh. still your body should be able to handle oh. that, though. I know, but it's also just random stupid genetics, you know. I found out that my my mom's brother, the youngest one, he also lost a, a testicle. Oh, well, there you go. It's his fault. And then uh, supposedly, <laughs> supposedly my grandpa's testicle would like would like inflame real big when he gets sick where did what happened to your other testicle the cancerous one did they throw it out or do you have it that's the big mystery of 2017 (laughs) (laughs) everybody asked me like bro what happened to your testicle do you you didn't ask for it i'm like no i just forgot to like ask and it's probably like cut up in a bin just thrown away do you get phantom pains no, I don't. You I don't never feel so. it. No, if anything, I just feel. I I used to feel like pain sometimes when I would walk up from the surgery, and uh, out of I, I got like um, after the around that same time I I was I started suffering from like uh, acid reflux, and that's been really not the best, you know. But besides that, I've been recovering. Um, my left testicle, the remaining one, got bigger. It has to do the work of two testicles now. <laughs> yeah, it's like just one big almighty, you know, fucking testicle. Do you ever think about the other one, this part of you that turned against you and tried to take you down, ruin uh, your career, and like all the things you were working for? That's so true, man. No, I, I just think I rest in peace. Like, because in the end, I don't think it was his choice. It was just something that happened. It's like it's not your choice when you get hit by a car, maybe. But this is a defector on the inside. Yeah, that's true, that's true. But what if, like, my genetics in my right ball, my right testicle, were, like, walking around, and then cancer just popped out of nowhere? Did... Having cancer change your perspective on life at all? Yeah, it told me not to like fuck around. Like masturbating for like 30 minutes every day is not good. Or sessions of 30 minutes three times a day. 
That's not good for your psyche or your fucking wrist or your blood flow or my knees. Yeah, because I'm like. Okay. So like just like like cutting off anything that wasn't like adding towards like accomplishing my goals, like being better at stand up, basically. How long have you been at stand up? I uh, a while, right? Yeah, I had two years. Um, this May. You're one of these guys who starts young. And it's just like your your whole life, is you you kind of commit to it young. It's like joining the military. It, yeah. You know, like going in young. Uh, to me, I think like I'm going in like just in the middle, because like when I think of young, I think of like Dave Chappelle. Oh, that's true. Like he's a uh, 18, genius, 16. Though. I see some comics that are like 16. That's true. Yeah. And then it's like, dude, by the time they're my age, they're already gonna be like four or five years deep. There's always someone younger than you. No, yeah, yeah. That's the that's the reality of it. I do have this philosophy though that like people that get it get into stand up like at twenty eight and up or like they have like kids like early on, like they just come out the gate like fucking like stronger than like your average person. I agree. Because you kinda have more opinions about stuff or mm -hmm. you're just generally smarter. That's mm -hmm. why I think uh, there's only young people on reality shows. Like, hmm. you, you know, it's rare to see somebody like 35 plus on a reality show because hmm. you're like too smart to like go on a show like that and like, embarrass yeah. yourself. Yeah, you're too smart to care while you're there. It's yeah. like, this is pointless. But if you're like 20, you're going to be like, I think I'm going to make friends. I'm going to, yeah. yeah. You're going to get into fights and get drunk and. Don't oh, fuck that. Go oh, nuts. Well, hmm. Well, how do you, how you, how are you faring in stand up? How do you like it? Um, I think it's the bomb diggity. <laughs> I think you're, it's the best thing since sliced bread. You go to a lot of you're at all the mics and you put on Instagram, and so I like looking at it and I'm like, oh, that's what that would have been like oh, going there. Yeah, I try to put it but, like on my like Instagram story. Yeah, and then. Uh, I got it from like seeing Frank Castillo do it when I was starting. Like mm -hmm. he would hit like five, six mics like a night and post like every single one like on his Instagram. And I was like, I don't want to post every single one, so I just do it like on my story, and then just write whatever I want on top. You did a thing at the comedy store where um, you had to perform as Mystery Dan, <laughs> who has been on this show. Who's a he's a Mystery Dan? Like that's yeah. it. Um, how did you how did you get into character for that? I I just like I hung out with the dude for a long fucking time, like I, like hours of talking to this guy. So, you, knowing that you were gonna be doing this? No, like like we were already like like he he came up to me like the first night, like on the Sunday I found out that my testicle was hard. Uh -huh. Like that afternoon I was like, man, fuck, I'm gonna really come to the show go. Up. And then uh, luckily I got up and then I talked about it. And then he came up to me and he was like, hey, my brother had cancer. And then he just told me all the like, experience about like death and like DMT and shit like that. And then I was like, yo, thank you. And then we just got along after that. We started talking to him. So it, was, uh, it wasn't like a random pairing. No. Like you guys he, have already had gotten to know each other. Yeah, for like a while. So his acts are like these kind of like old school monologue things. Yeah. So I would imagine that would give you like a, some kind of structure to do mm -hmm. your impression of him off of. What things about your act did he pick up on where you were like, oh, okay, I do do that? Maybe like the way I say it. I'm like, I'm like the way I deliver the jokes. I was like, yeah, he did it. He got like the nice nitty gritty across is like what you want you know like even if it's not word for word you at least want them to hit it like the way the joke is intended to at least the rhythm of it yeah the rhythm the, the riff the of it <laughs> dun, dun, dun. yeah you gonna go to that scorpions and megadeth concert at the forum shit dude since I, as soon as i get a job i'm gonna be there there's discount tickets online for forty dollars plus service fee. Get the fuck out of here. Yeah. Right now. Yeah. 
<sighs> I'm not sure if my girlfriend's watching, but um, $40 discounted ticket. <laughs> a gold star. Because look, that's $20 for the Scorpions and $20 for Megadeth. That's a fucking dude. When I, when I found out about this, I, that's the first like post on my Instagram. I'm like, what? Are you kidding me? This is like two of my favorite bands growing up. And they're playing on the same bill. Do you think they'll do a, a thing at the end where like everybody comes out? Uh, yeah, I didn't even think about that. Dave but, Mustaine uh, comes out for Rock Me Like a Hurricane. Oh, uh, they'd be so cheesy, dude. No, I don't, I don't think so, but maybe anything's possible, right? <laughs> anything's possible. <laughs> hey, if you could survive cancer, anything's Dave possible. Mustaine could play Rock dude, Me Like a Hurricane. Did, I fucking read Dave Mustaine's book like in high school, like when it came out, like his biography or whatever. And then uh, he talks about, like, when he died for those six minutes where, like, his heart wasn't beating after, like, that one show he was, like, on, he used to do, what, what were they called, like, they were, like, uh, it was, like, cocaine and some uh, eight balls. Yeah, speed, speed ball. Yeah, speed, something like the that. Speed right? ball is, it's, I don't know. I don't know what it is. I'm not that cool. <laughs> but it's something that rock stars did in the 90s. Yeah, dude, he fucking, he was doing that, like, very heavy duty. And then one day, like after the show, like his heart just stopped, and he was dead for like six minutes. And after that, like he came back alive, and then he was like a born again Christian after that. Oh yeah. Yeah, I don't like that either. You don't like that? Fuck no. Do you think maybe he lost some blood to his brain during that time? Oh, you might be fucking right. And that made him more susceptible to becoming <laughs> like doing some stupid things. You know, like religion and. Firing his bandmates all the time and stuff like that. Yeah, dude. All the fu well, some of them deserved it. <laughs> Rest in peace, Nick Menza. He died last year. He was a drummer. He he pretended he had cancer, I think, like during one of the tours, like, and that's why he didn't come back or something. He pretended he had cancer. Yeah, some, yeah that's what Dave said like, in the book. Why would you pretend to have cancer? I forget. Like, I think he got didn't want to play for the band or some shit, or he was too fucked up to play. So he just like tipped out like unexpectedly. That sounds fake. I don't know, man. Dave Mustaine might have brain damage. That that, that was before oh. the brain damage. Oh. Yeah. So I guess it, it was just when uh, Nick Menza. It was a lie, right? It was just when Nick Menza had said so that he gets not play for whatever reason. I forget, you know. And then uh, Nick Menza died in uh, the Valley Studios. What is it? Uh, Studio City. Yeah, oh, the, the gold, no, what was it, um, Sun City, or no, what's it called? The one where they record all the albums, in, in Van Nuys? Yeah, no, no, not in Van Nuys, uh, just the, uh, what's next to Universal, like the, the city, isn't it Studio City? Oh, Studio City, yeah. yeah. He was playing like a gig there, and then oh, okay. he, he had died like on stage or like after that. I think he was still like doing blow, like, he was like 48. How would you feel about dying on stage? Yeah, it's not so bad. That sounds not, pretty cool, right? Oh, man. I mean, Carlin tried to do it. He was like, blah, 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 blah. And if what I'm saying is wrong, may God strike me down right this instant. See? Yeah. yeah. That'd be cool as fuck, man. But not till I'm like fucking 200 or something, you know? I don't think there's ever a bad time to die on stage. Dude, fuck that, dude. You get your legacy no, right there. No, there's no legacy. Fuck that, dude. I mean, if you're like... Dude, there's a couple of comics that have died. Oh, yeah, that guy that jumped off the comedy store? No, not him. Like, most recently, like, some people that, like, the comics in the scene knew, like, he died, like, four years ago, and he was, like, funny, right? And, like, I'm sure people love them, and I'm not even sure if, like, 200 years down the line will he be a legend or not, but... He's not being talked about like a legend or not being brought about, talked about like that. Well, that's why you have to have a like very ironic death. Oh, like diagnosis? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> like, you think that would give it? Oh, for sure, yeah. Great career move. Depends not how everybody you die. could do it. How do you die on stage? Um, oh, well, the guy from Pantera got shot or something. That's pretty cool. Yeah. I was Tiny Tim had a heart attack. The I was thinking of, like, what if you're, like, killing so hard that, like, some cholo at the bar, like, like he just, like, 
involuntarily pulls his gun to shoot you <laughs> just because he wants he can't laugh no more <laughs> and he wants you to stop <laughs> but, like, he, like he's about to like cry he's like can we i can't live like no bitch and then he just shoots you he becomes hysterical <laughs> but i don't know man I, I don't i don't see why that would make people a legend like just because you died on stage you know it doesn't hurt it doesn't hurt you know what doesn't hurt though killing on stage every yeah. single time and then keep getting better and better and playing the bigger fucking stages and shit and then going out like crawling after like 16 HBO specials and like three or four bucks I think that's the way to do it or like legend yeah I think that's the only way to do it almost. just stick it around you know, persistence Persistence, but not just persistence, but like the growth of the comedian, like how Carlin was from like fucking class clown to like how he is. And they're like, uh, it's bullshit and it's bad for you. Like completely different fucking acts, you know. And then, and then at the end of his life, he's like, he's not bullshitting, dude. He's talking about like the real motherfucker, like religions of fucking farce. And like, you know, it, it can give you comfort, but you know, more people have died under the, under, in the name of God than, you know, bombs or anything else. Well, what did that Soviet doctor tell you? He was like, uh... They wrote in your don't, notebook. Ne never give up, don't panic, and you'll make it. There you have it. Yeah. Roger, thank you so much for coming on the wow, show. Dude, that's crazy. Um, it was crazy. <laughs> What's your Instagram handle? For if you like, you'll literally see everything in, about this guy's life. He's very transparent. It's it's fun. You know, not everything, not the bad stuff, but. Uh, Dude, I'm trying to like get a get the vlog going. Yeah. Get like the. Uh -huh. I have a blog. You guys, I'm on Roger four two four L. On Instagram and uh, soon to be on Twitter, on Facebook as Roger Lopez. The Facebook is the same as the Instagram. It's uh, oh, yeah, I checked yeah. both. The Instagram's good. I really like it. Thanks to you, Yeah. But thank you anyway, and thank you all for tuning in. Until next time, this is Adam Papagan reminding you that there's a place you can go, and it's your mind. Good night. Yeah. Is there any of this, this bread? Mm -hmm.